Find within the walls of a South African jail. The young lawyer from India found no reason to complain. Some say that jail is a palace. Others look upon it as a beautiful garden. Some others hold that through the jail gates we shall pass from our present bondage to freedom. The year was 1907. The young lawyer from India was Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi led his fellow Indians in a non-violent struggle against racial oppression for eight years. They marched into forbidden territory. They burned their registration papers. They expected to be arrested and they were not disappointed. Gandhi said, non-violent refusal to cooperate with injustice is the way to defeat it. J.C. Smuts, the interior minister, tells Gandhi, you reduce me to helplessness. How can we lay hands on you without looking like villains? He became known for his ability to mobilize people and for his increasingly simple way of life. He gave his non-violent weapon a name, Satyagraha, holding to truth. In every decade and on every continent, underdogs have taken up Gandhi's strategies to fight for their rights and freedom. Nonviolence means fighting back, but you're fighting back with other weapons. The power that Gandhi discovered changed the 20th century. Major funding for this series was provided by Susan and Perry Lerner. Additional funding was provided by the Albert Einstein Institution, advancing the study of strategic nonviolent action in conflicts throughout the world. Elizabeth and John H. Van Merkenstein III, Abby and Alan Levy, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Spring weather comes early in 1940. Adding to the illusion that tranquil Denmark can remain untouched by the war that is spreading across Europe. Danish government has proclaimed neutrality and reduced its armed forces by half. Denmark intends to remain at peace. On the morning of April 9th, everything changes. Attacking by air, land and sea, the German war machine meets token opposition in the south, but then Denmark orders its troops to lay down their arms. We could not imagine that it had anything to do with the war or occupation or anything like that. We flew out of our beds and looked out of the window. They were very close. Those Germans, they were always so noisy. 
suddenly we realized that this was something very terrible. The invaders capture the headquarters of the Danish army general staff without firing a shot. Disbelieving Danes wander the streets, watching helplessly. German leaflets and posters say, we come not as enemies but as friends, and promise that Denmark will remain under Danish law and government. It's hard to believe. We asked them, what do you want? Well, we have come to help you against the British. And we said, we guess you're the right ones to do that. Hitler has occupied an entire country in under six hours. Late that afternoon, Danish Prime Minister Tolbald Snorning asks the Danish parliament to officially accept the terms of the German occupation. My father felt that his policy was the least harmful for the people. If we had used the military on April 9th, they would have bombed Copenhagen without a doubt. And thousands of people would have lost their lives. Rather than suffer certain defeat, Danish political leaders choose not to fight. Their goal is survival. They will attempt to hold the Germans to their promises, to respect Danish neutrality. They will negotiate the terms of occupation under protest, hoping to turn the charade of friendly relations to Denmark's advantage. The king was in place, uh, the parliament was uh, legislating, the police was in charge uh, of the law and order, the Danish courts were functioning, and the Jewish community was functioning. At the start, German troops are well-mannered and respectful. But their very presence is a provocation. Danes wonder, now that we have capitulated, what next? They have not prepared for a German occupation. They have no Gandhi. They have no resistance organization. In most homes, the attitude was that we have to, to accept this and try to make it work, but uh, uh, for goodness sake, don't uh, try to have anything to do with them. They, they never speak to a German soldier. and. Uh, uh, be careful what you do. Danish cabinet ministers adopt a policy of resistance disguised as collaboration. Danes will cooperate with the Germans, but only as a tactic to preserve self-rule. German demands will be negotiated by diplomats, delayed by bureaucrats, and quietly obstructed when possible. For many Danes, it's not enough. Denmark was humiliated, and the whole population actually suddenly felt that they had lost something, something of their dignity, something of their country's dignity. What were you to do? What could you do in this situation? You couldn't go out fighting. The, the, the fight was not there. So they gathered in the park of the city and, and, and sing national anthems. Every week, the songfests grow, signaling the birth of Danish solidarity against a common enemy. And Danes take new pride in their king, who rides alone every morning as always. People were very proud that we had a king. It was like a way of demonstrating against the Germans and we weren't interested in any form of dictatorship. Germans ignore exhibitions of national pride, as long as they do not interfere with German objectives. To use Denmark's farms to feed the German army, to use Danish factories and shipyards to supply war material. 
Relations with Germany are handled by Danish Foreign Minister Erik Scavenius, a man many believe is pro-German. When Ben Priebel argued with him and said, well, in the long run, we are losing uh, our uh, respect uh, all over the country, he said, well, yes, uh, that's correct, but uh, we might keep our respect and be, uh, and, and be dead, all of us. Um, he said, uh, how many corpses do you want in order to save your honor? Scavenius wants the Germans to think they're getting what they want, to keep pressure off Denmark. In November 1941, he goes to Berlin to sign a treaty justifying the German invasion of the Soviet Union. When his photograph with Hitler is published in Denmark, outraged students take to the streets. After five days, Danish police restore order but public support for the Scavenius policies is severely damaged. Underground resistance leaders condemn even tactical collaboration as treason. Their primary weapon is information. The illegal press reaches two and a half million, Denmark's entire adult population. Uncensored news of the war, gathered from the BBC and other sources, fuels Danish hopes. And the illegal press also encourages active resistance of all kinds. Small-scale attacks, arson, the stealing of weapons from German soldiers, pouring sugar into gas tanks, are the work of untrained high school students. They say, if the adults won't do something, we will. German authorities order local police to crack down, but patriotic young Danes are determined. I was very angry at the time. A lot of young people were angry. And we were angry that we hadn't done more, resisted more than we had. We later realized that it was a hopeless situation. But that doesn't change the feeling, which I still have, that we protected our country so poorly. In November, SS General Werner Best takes charge in Denmark. Hitler tells him to rule with an iron hand. Best pressures Erik Scavenius, the new prime minister. But most Danes have turned against the Scavenius policies. On BBC broadcast from London, a Danish political exile, John Christmas Moller, now speaks defiantly against the Prime Minister and calls for active resistance. Understand that the merciless rule here, and it's time for Denmark to take a stand. Are you going to join and are you willing to contribute? We must ensure that we do not harm the soul of the nation. Spring 1943. The German occupation is three years old. A facade of cooperation continues, but popular loyalty is shifting to the resistance movement. By day, the government campaigns against sabotage. By night, explosions rock the factories and rail lines, cutting German supply lines at their source. By summer of 1943, reports of German defeats in Russia, North Africa and Southern Europe encouraged the Danes to more vigorous resistance. There were strikes in the provincial towns, not only strikes in the factories, but uh, the whole cities uh, where administration, uh, stores, uh, everything was closed. Sabotage attacks more than double in only one month. But those Danes who are unable to carry out sabotage find other ways to resist, even defying their own government. First of all, we worked really slowly. 
We never worked at the same speed as before the war. We received orders to build new ships, but the ships were never finished. The construction was sabotaged. So in the end, they had to drag them down to Germany to finish them. The Danish authority did whatever they could to stop the strikes. And they found out that this was impossible. They could not. They had lost the authority. Um, the, the authority of, of leading these masses uh, lay with um, some local, unauthorized, uh, not elected leaders and with the illegal press. A government in name only. Danish political leaders have one last act to perform. On the morning of August 28, 1943, they receive an ultimatum from the German occupiers. Strikes must be banned, curfews imposed, saboteurs executed. Denmark must answer by 4 p.m. Parliament debates the demands for six hours. Now, these were demands they could not say yes to. And then they told the Germans that they could not accept this ultimatum. Foreign Minister Scavenius and his cabinet resign. Parliament goes home. Denmark is no longer under Danish authority. Direct German rule, postponed for three years by the Scavenius policy of cooperation, descends on Denmark. The Wehrmacht occupies key facilities. Gatherings of five or more persons are banned. The new rules are brutally enforced. Now we knew where we were two uh, opposite parties and cooperation had become impossible so we would have to go our different ways uh, trying to make things work of course but uh, there was no doubt now that they were the enemy and we were the occupied country but the fig leaf of friendly relations removed germany has suffered a defeat and now faces a hostile and rebellious population. Danish resistance groups quickly fill the vacuum, communicating through the well-organized illegal press. Just weeks later, they face their first crisis, when Adolf Hitler orders his commanders to impose Germany's racial laws in Denmark. Having survived from the outbreak of the war, there was, of course, kind of, you know, uh, belief that uh, things would be all right. But uh, the, the shield which had protected us against the fate of uh, Jews in the rest of Europe, uh, the shield uh, disappeared, and we were standing undefended against the Germans. The German Gestapo has obtained a list of names and addresses for the 7,000 Danish Jews. But plans for the roundup have been leaked. The Jews are warned. Thousands of Danes step forward to save them. I remember the shock I got when, uh, when uh, the day I went to school and uh, and uh, suddenly the headmaster knocked on the door and called uh, me and another Jewish boy out of the class and told us, you better, you better hurry up because you, your parents are waiting for you. You have to, to get out of your flat. The Germans are coming tonight. The roundup begins on the night of October 1st. But the Jews have been hidden in attics and cellars, 
in the churches and homes of thousands of Danes who have spontaneously taken them in. We were sent, for example, one time to Fyn, to Odense, to pick up some Jews who were arriving by train from Jutland. And we were to help them pass as casually as possible through the German checkpoints at Storbilt. The ferries there were closely guarded by the Germans. So it was necessary for us to pretend that we had a relationship with these people. Their refuge will be Sweden, only a few miles across waters patrolled by the German Navy. They hide in forests and wait. Herbert Pundig and his family are picked up by one of the many fishermen who risk the voyage and save all but a few hundred of Denmark's Jews. I looked back uh, towards the coast and I saw something which I'll never forget in my own life. I'm not a religious person myself, but still I'm, I'm still moved when I think about it. Uh, on, the, on this sandy beach I saw the three persons uh, the, our, uh, so to say, saviour, his wife and the wife of the fisherman, kneeling uh, on the beach uh, with folded, lifting hands towards heaven, praying for our, our safe passage. The rescue of the Jews has united and inspired Danes, just as they are coming to view the resistance movement as their de facto government. The Freedom Council publishes a first clandestine leaflet in November 1943. The program of resistance aimed at denying Germany the benefits of occupation. With explosives and equipment airdropped by British forces, the underground avoids human targets, concentrating on war-related industry. Their first targets are Danish industries and transport that supply the German army. Each success brings harsher and deadlier reprisals by the Nazis who bomb theatres, clubs and Copenhagen's renowned Tivoli Gardens. In a desperate move to stop the explosions, the German governor puts the population of Copenhagen under curfew in June 1944. It was triggered off by a uh, large sabotage at one of the weapon factories. And really not the sabotage, but the um, open, uh, open joy by the Copenhageners would see the smoke going up from the factory, which annoyed the German commandant. So that he declared a curfew, um, which was to start every afternoon at uh, 6 o'clock. Workers at the Burmeister and Wayne shipyard retaliate with an ingenious but risky scheme. We had hoped to get rid of the curfew. We wanted to have our freedom. We didn't want to be locked up at night. At 12 noon we went to the gate and start kicking it. We said we wanted to go home because we needed to water our gardens. 1,200 shipyard workers go home early. They insist it's not a strike. They must tend their gardens in the afternoon because the curfew stops them from gardening in the evening. The go-home-early movement spreads fast. Thousands of workers in other factories walk off their jobs, but few go to their gardens. Congregating in the streets, they demonstrate, build bonfires, and taunt German patrols. Six Danes are killed on the first day. There were barricades in the streets. Everything was set on fire in the streets. 
All work stopped. No one wanted to go to work. All these things, all these things created a sense in the population that the Danes now had to fight against the Germans. And that was probably the most crucial effect of the general strike. Nazi governor Werner Best tightens the vice daily. Troops are ordered to shoot at groups of five or more. Then he cuts off electricity, gas and water. Danes respond by cooking on fires and dipping water from a nearby lake. Best tries to blockade the city, to cut contact with the outside world. The population follows instructions from resistance leaders. Until the curfew ends and shooting stop, stay on strike, says the Freedom Council. I looked up to it. It was the country's lawful, the ones we listened to. We'll be on strike until tomorrow at 12 o'clock. It was very, very clear to see. The people follow that. And precisely at 12 o'clock the next day, everything started up again. The Germans had great respect for that. Best is desperate to resume production. But his military options are limited as troops have been taken out of Denmark to fight the losing war. Most of all, he knows that Danish workers are worth more alive than dead. On the ninth day, Best concedes. He will end the curfew and withdraw his troops if the strikers go back to work. The Freedom Council issues a victory bulletin which ends the walkout. It declares strikes are their most effective weapon. Unwittingly, the Danes have adopted Gandhi's favorite tactic by simply withdrawing their obedience. Recognizing the power of non-cooperation, the Council shifts its emphasis from encouraging sabotage to coordinating strikes. In the next month, they call for a series of symbolic two-minute stoppages. When the clock on the city hall struck 12 noon, everything stopped in the city hall square. There would be complete silence. And that's just something you did. Denmark suffers through one last brutal winter with shortages in fuel, water and food. And then it was spring. As was normal, in those days we gathered round the wireless to hear the message from uh, BBC. And then uh, all of a sudden the, uh, uh, the transmission uh, was interrupted and then came this wonderful message that uh, the Germans had uh, given up. A Danish historian concluded, Denmark had not won the war, but neither had it been defeated or destroyed. Most Danes had not been brutalized, by the Germans or by each other. Nonviolent resistance saved the country and contributed more to the Allied victory than Danish arms ever could have. Den følelse, man fik i kroppen, it was a physical feeling, a combination of euphoria and the chill. It felt so strange. The tears welled up, and I remember very clearly that I spontaneously said, so we survive. Those were probably the first words out of my mouth. So we survive.
Po pierwsze była. It was the right atmosphere for a strike. Przed godziną szóstą. Before six a.m. we started distributing the leaflets. I w każdej chwili mogłem zostać zatrzymany. At any moment, I could have been stopped and arrested. So obviously, I was afraid. Workers at the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk are angry enough to strike. Angry at recent price increases and the firing of a popular co-worker. But only a few realize their strike will pit them against the full force of the communist government in Poland. People started yelling, open the gate, we're going downtown to the regional communist party headquarters. Then we knew we had to start singing the national anthem. That would calm people down. We're not going to make the mistake of 1970, when we went into the streets and tanks rolled over us. Every worker in Poland knows the story of December 1970. Strikers left the shipyard and marched on Communist Party headquarters. Six were killed and 300 injured. They learned the futility of taking on armed troops in the street. One of them was a 27-year-old shipyard electrician named Lech Wałęsa. He was fired for union activism in 1976. But now, in 1980, he has returned to help organize the strike. During those uh, 10 years since 1970, when I was a leader in the same shipyard, I had been thinking where mistakes have been made. And if fate gave me a chance to lead again, how would I do it? This time, Wałęsa and other strike leaders have planned carefully. Wałęsa is known and liked by many at the shipyard. He announces, we will occupy the shipyard. I'll be the last to leave. Their strike will be strictly non-violent. The government will have no excuse to begin shooting. The strike committee commandeers a cafeteria in Wałęsa's old department. Their first step is to make sure news of the strike is not suppressed by the regime. Alina Piankowska, a shipyard nurse, telephones Jacek Koron at the Workers' Defense Committee in Warsaw, who will pass the news to Radio Free Europe and the BBC. Thanks to that, the world could hear about us. Not only the world, also the families of the Gdańsk shipyard workers learned that way why their husbands or fathers or sons didn't come home at the regular time. And this phone call caused people to get organized in the city of Gdańsk. On Friday morning, the strike has widened. Public transportation has stopped. The port is closed and 22 factories are on strike, 50,000 workers in all. Government has cut phone lines to the rest of Poland for fear the strikes will spread. But it's too late. All over Poland, people know about the Gdansk strike. In the cafeteria, the strike committee hammers out a list of demands they prepare leaflets for the striking workers. At the top of the list is the right to free and independent unions and the right to strike. Unprecedented rights that Poland's communist regime will surely resist. On Saturday, the shipyard director has received orders from his communist party superiors and is ready to begin negotiating. We got instructions to do anything to end the strike, do anything to limit it to just the Gdańsk shipyard. The shipyard offers generous wage increases and better working conditions, everything but independent unions. 
But when the vote is taken, management has packed the committee with party officials. The terms are accepted, and workers begin going home. As thousands head for the gate, Anna Valentinovic, recently fired but now reinstated by the strike agreement, reminds them that their settlement has abandoned other workers who have joined the strike. What about those who supported us? There were 40 factors. What about these people? I felt ashamed and hopeless. What should we do? Alina Pienkowska, the nurse, runs to the main gate and tries to stop the workers. A small crowd gathers to listen as she pleads with them to stay. If we really want free trade unions, if we really want any influence on management, we should act in solidarity with the others, that is, to continue the strike. Thousands have gone home, but a few hundred are persuaded by Alina's argument. They will stay the night to keep the strike alive. During that night, they take a fateful decision to form an interfactory strike committee to represent all workers in all of Poland. This committee will magnify their force a thousand times and create a base of popular power never before seen in communist Poland. On Sunday morning, workers improvise a Catholic mass inside the main gate. Thousands of townspeople gather outside. The gate is decorated with flowers, messages of support, and a photograph of the Pope, who is Polish. It's an unexpected show of support for the strikers. I had never expected that, such a reaction from the citizens of Gdańsk. It gave me a lot of courage and energy to act, because I realized that we were probably going to be able to achieve something. The Interfactory Strike Committee has published 21 demands, a document that has galvanized workers in other cities. One of them is a 27-year-old electrician at a tractor factory near Warsaw, Zbigniew Bujak. Suddenly we learned about the strike in Gdansk. We read the 21 demands. And as we say in Poland, we felt, literally speaking, like we caught God by the arm. We suddenly felt that we had in our hands a tool, which, if we don't make a mistake, must produce some wonderful fruit. In Gdansk, the strikers who spent the weekend inside the shipyard have been rewarded. 15,000 workers now return and rejoin the strike and it's spreading to other cities. And when people were coming back, when I saw these people outside, this was a feeling you have hmm, maybe once in a lifetime. I felt this victory of ours. I was only afraid that, that it's not wasted. Will we have enough wisdom to keep it up? The Interfactory Strike Committee waits for a response to the 21 demands. While they wait, more factories join the strike. They steadily gain leverage over a system that has never permitted the existence of a power separate from the Communist Party. Everywhere, workers follow the example set in Gdansk, reducing risk by staying inside their workplaces. We are not going out of the gate, because there it is very easy for the authorities to provoke, 
simply provoke and then introduce police and the military. So we wanted to avoid that. We knew about the activities of Gandhi, for example, or what Martin Luther King did. And we knew that these people, building the theory of non-violent resistance, they won. The second week begins. Strikers are publishing a daily bulletin called Solidarity and making preparations for a long struggle. Well, you could say that inside the shipyard there was a second government of Poland. We had a sense of humor about it. We had the Minister of Communication, the Minister of Social Welfare and Salaries, who gathered money. There was a Minister of Finance who kept the money we gathered from various companies that were coming here. We had persons responsible for every operation of the strike. There was a Minister of Security who was responsible for all the security guards, defense of the fences, and the food. Everything worked like clockwork, like a Swiss watch. Their patience has given them strength. By the ninth day, the Interfactory Strike Committee speaks for nearly half a million workers in 370 factories in every industry and region of Poland. Government negotiators arrive at the shipyard. The long stalemate appears to be over. Jerzy Kolodziewski, provincial governor of Gdansk, was on the negotiating team. Some people were clapping, happy that here is the authorities, the province governor, entering the shipyard, starting the negotiations. Others were swearing, booing, calling me names. I had no doubt I was going to be the sacrificial lamp. Workers demand that all discussions be broadcast over shipyard loudspeakers. Polish news media must be allowed to cover the strike and talks. The government has come to the bargaining table after 10 days of stalling. It all backfired. It turned out that these 10 days were used by the strikers to strengthen organizationally, to strengthen the Interfactory Strike Committee, and to convince people that without negotiations with the committee, an end to the conflict is impossible. Mieczysław Jagielski, Poland's first deputy prime minister, faces Lech Wałęsa, a 37-year-old electrician. Jagielski is accustomed to microphones and cameras. Wałęsa describes himself as a simple worker, following his heart. Until now, the regime has called the strikers traitors. Now the deputy prime minister has been sent to negotiate with them. The strike committee is cautious, knowing that if they push too hard, the game will be lost, and that Soviet military intervention is a real possibility. There was a whole range of people in the Central Committee who realized that agreement for free trade unions is an agreement to change the system, the political system. Also, they couldn't gain approval from the Soviet Union. I know that. They were carrying out such talks and the Russians wouldn't even want to hear about it. What? Free trade unions? What are you talking about? Negotiators for the workers are in no hurry. Having seized the initiative, they go word by word over the language dealing with independent unions, brushing aside the government's eagerness to move on to other issues.
The tactics of the strikers were this. We have to get agreement for free trade unions. All the rest will follow. Valenza said, Mr. Prime Minister, let's not talk about these things. These are details. What we have to have is free trade unions. During nearly two weeks of talks, Valenza reports regularly to the rank and file. He seeks consensus with an openness unheard of in Poland's official unions. Worker solidarity is not lost on their adversaries. No previous strike was carried out under such, so decisively, with such will of victory and such consolidation. The conviction that we have to leave this room victorious. It was the conviction not only of the Interfactory Strike Committee, but of all the workers who surrounded us, and the dozens of thousands of people who surrounded the shipyard. All this had its effect. It softened us. Frankly speaking, it did. Idle factories create pressures that benefit the strikers. In Gdansk, valuable machinery and unfinished ships are being held hostage. Increasingly desperate to resume production, the regime gradually accepts an accommodation. On Sunday, August 31st, an agreement is ready to sign. They have won pay raises, a five-day work week, relaxed press censorship, free trade unions, and the right to strike. Seeing these accords being signed, we immediately realized that this is the first stage and it is only now that the real race against time, against the clock, begins for us. And the real tactical, intellectual struggle with the other party, with those in power, is beginning. Because it was obvious to us that they were signing the accords, but they will immediately want to break them. The race against time begins as Wałęsa and Valentinovich tour the country to celebrate their success, recruit new members, and create hundreds of affiliated local unions. In four months, Solidarity membership grows to 10 million. Explicitly concerned with the welfare of Polish working people, Solidarity can't avoid an obvious reality. Its very existence challenges the supremacy of the Communist Party. I was feeling that, from the very beginning, the other side was preparing to hit us. But when they were ready to hit 100 organizations, by that time they were a 1,000 organizations. When they got prepared to hit the 1,000, it was not 1,000, it was 10,000. And it was not 100,000 members, but a million, and later 10 million. They must grow quickly, becoming big enough that when the inevitable backlash comes, solidarity will be too powerful to destroy. From the start, union activists are harassed, their newspapers censored, 
Offices raided. Workers are ordered to work two Saturdays a month, an open breach of the agreement. Solidarity fights back with strike threats. Wydaje mi się, że w poniedziałek postawię cały kraj na nogi. Zrobię strajk. Pan tak przekaże to. Ja mam dość żartów i podjazdów. Panie wojewódź, pan dobrze wie. Więc pan przekaże rządowi, że w poniedziałek prawdopodobnie dam rozkaz do strajku generalnego. Dziękuję. Trochę demokracji, trochę wolności osobistej. Przez każdych ludzi. O, nie dam rady. A year after it was founded, the union re-elects Wałęsa as president. Lech Wałęsa. But Solidarity's open democratic structure makes it vulnerable to its own extremists and to infiltrators. There were some agents. You can hear them on the tapes even now who were pouring oil on the flames, saying, to make a demonstration in Warsaw, gather 100,000, 200,000 people, and then hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Obviously, there was no other course for the authorities. Either give up power and start democratic elections, or tanks and put us in prison. On the night of December the 11th, 1981, Communist authorities raid a conference of Solidarity's national leaders. The entire Presidium is arrested in its hotel. In the next two days, Solidarity activists are rounded up by the thousands. Martial law is declared on December 13th. At the moment when they hit us, I said this. Right at this moment, you have lost. We are winning. And you have driven the last nails into your communist coffin. Martial law is an admission that the regime has lost the people's consent. Relying solely on the power to prohibit, the regime has lost all ability to persuade. Though the union is banned, popular support for it is undiminished. Solidarity becomes a non-violent resistance movement, infused with a sense of Polish patriotism. Stripped of a central leadership, Solidarity lives on in thousands of small organizations too many to crush. An underground press unifies them as they both resist and ignore state power. I knew this was my method to fight. I am not afraid of you. You can lock me up, you can kill me, but you cannot defeat me. So the struggle will continue. It will last some time. It will cost, but we shall win. For seven years, repression creates the appearance of stability. But below the surface, the foundation is rotting. In summer 1988, it collapses. As price increases, food lines and rationing paralyze the country. A new wave of strikes is beyond the government's ability to control. The regime offers to re-legalize Solidarity if Lech Wałęsa will negotiate an end to the strikes. Within three days, the country is back at work. Solidarity has proven itself a capable and responsible force. In February 1989, Solidarity, the government, the party and the church begin roundtable talks on Poland's future. After two months of negotiations, they agree on free unions, a free press, and parliamentary elections. In a two-month campaign, Solidarity candidates are popular, but no one expects them to dislodge the Communist Party. On 
June 4th, 1989, Poland votes in the first open democratic elections in more than 60 years. That night, in the square outside Lech Wałęsa's apartment, the victory is celebrated. Solidarity has defeated the Communist Party by a margin of 10 to 1. If they just opened a small crack in these doors to freedom, I'd put my working class boot in those doors, and they won't close them. For nearly 10 years, General Augusto Pinochet has ruled Chile unchallenged. We needed someone to dare to say to the dictator that he was a dictator, and to say that the dictatorship was a dictatorship, and confront it on its own turf. Not on the turf of arms, just to dare to tell them that what we had in Chile was wrong and that it had to be changed. Pinochet came to power in a 1973 coup that left the elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, dead. The generals say that they have saved Chile from chaos, from becoming another Cuba. They promise a quick return to civilian rule, but their actions suggest otherwise. During the first months of the military regime, the number of people detained in prisons reached more than 40,000. At least 3,000 individuals were assassinated, executed, or their bodies disappeared forever. In the next decade, political parties and unions are banned. Most newspapers are closed. Ruthlessly eliminating any challenge to his authority, Pinochet's rule casts fear into every corner of Chilean life. It was a very permeating paranoia, and it was with everyone. Everybody had experienced some sort of oppression in their family, and they were very cautious. My husband and I would go to a social gathering, and he wouldn't introduce me to anyone. And I said, well, well, why won't you introduce me to people? He said, oh, we don't do that now. It's too dangerous. You really, you don't really want to know people's names. Fear, terror. If you have a people afraid, you can control them. And Pinochet, if something he will leave in history, he's the man of terror. Executions, disappearances, and prisons keep the dictatorship in power for 10 years. By 1983, a severe economic crisis has pushed unemployment to 30%. As Chileans feel they have nothing left to lose, open opposition to the regime becomes thinkable for the first time. The first signs of opposition appear at the heart of Chile's economy, in the copper mines of the Andes Mountains. Miners are amongst Chile's best-paid workers in the country's largest and most lucrative export industry. Their leader is 29-year-old Rodolfo Segel, a payroll clerk at Chile's largest copper mine. 
recently elected president of the National Labour Congress. Segel wants his members to take the first step, a nationwide strike. Ten years had gone by and nobody had gone out into the street. We had to see what reaction the country would have and then to see if the country would dare to do this. Our goal was to open people's eyes and to tell them, we can do it, it is possible, we can do this. A week before the strike is to begin, Pinochet's troops surround the copper mines. Segel knows that there will be bloodshed if the strike goes forward. They change their plans. Instead of a strike, they proclaim a national day of protest. With only a few days to prepare, they must mobilize not just union members, but the whole population. In four days, we had to do everything. That meant to write the 10 points, the instructions for the citizens to as to how to protest, to walk slowly on the sidewalks and go slowly through the streets in your car. Don't send your kids to school. Don't buy anything. I remember that morning. And at the beginning, you didn't know if someone was walking slowly, driving his car slowly, or walking slowly on the sidewalk because he was just taking a walk or because they were protesting. Until finally at noon, it was so obvious. It was so obvious that everything was slower. It was so evident that the city started to close down. As darkness falls, no one knows whether the final overt act of protest will succeed. At exactly 8 p.m., it begins, tentatively at first. I don't know who was more surprised by this, but there were two groups who were very surprised. One was the government, the dictatorship, and the second group who was surprised were the political leaders of the opposition. They couldn't believe what had happened. And the next day, there was a sense of sort of, what did you do last night? Did you see it? Oh yes, I was out banging my pots and pans with my neighbors. And so there was a real sense of, of complicity all of a sudden in a society where each human being had literally become a complete island. And the next day when the protest finished, at the first meeting that we had, we decided to have a protest every month. And we did that during nine or ten months. Every month a protest. And that was chaos for the military regime, because we didn't protest with arms. That gave us more power. Mainstream political parties suddenly re-emerge when they see that public opposition is possible. After 10 years underground, they now assume leadership of the burgeoning movement. A mood approaching euphoria grows as the protests grow every month. People start to believe that mass demonstrations alone will bring down the dictatorship.
mainstream opposition protests are strictly non-violent. Brutal police repression of the monthly demonstrations seems intended to intimidate, to stop the movement. But it has no effect. In early August, one day before the fourth protest is scheduled, Pinochet installs a new interior minister, Sergio Harpa. Harpa is instructed to begin a dialogue with the opposition. In a contradictory gesture on the same day, Pinochet deploys thousands of troops in the streets of the capital. An ominous prelude to the next day's demonstrations. Security forces break up the August protest with unprecedented force. A police statement admits that 17 civilians have been killed. The actual number is much higher. It was very violent. And that's when I realized that we couldn't keep on going down this road. Because the violence was too strong. Pinochet had 16,000 soldiers on the streets of Santiago. More than 80 people were killed, and the population started to rebel. Shocked by the bloodshed, the new Cardinal of Chile's Catholic Church offers to host the dialogue that Pinochet has promised. At the first meeting, Gabriel Valdez told me that he had to give me a document. And I told him that I would not take this document because it is an agreement that you drew up this morning, demanding the resignation of the President of the Republic. That you don't recognize him as being legitimate. And if the President of the Republic is not the legitimate President, I have nothing to do here because I represent him. So this is where it all ends, right here. Buenos días. As Pinochet celebrates his birthday in November, he has stopped Sergio Harper's meetings with the opposition. Harper's small concessions, limited political activity, the return of exiles, an end to book censorship were too much for the general. The dialogue is over. No, there wasn't any result. It was very frustrating. The regime didn't change at all. And Harpa himself was left there as a politician with no importance. In fact, the control of the government passed on to much harder hands. Opposition groups have been naive to think that Pinochet would negotiate an end to his own power. Protesters have not loosened the dictator's grip, but they have shown Pinochet they cannot be crushed by force, and they have opened up political space they will use to organize against him. Viva Chile! In late November 1985, Half a million attend the largest political rally in Chilean history. Amigos, amigos. Gabriel Valdez speaks for 11 opposition parties and the Catholic Church. The National Accord, formed to lead a non-violent transition to democracy. Valdez warns, if we don't support the National Accord, we are heading towards civil war. In Chile's poor neighborhoods, the Poblaciones, a low-intensity war has already begun. Hard times have fallen hardest here, making fertile ground for Chile's Marxist and Communist parties. Not many have personally taken up arms, but the ideology of violent revolution is accepted. The regime sees the Poblaciones as enemy territory. Early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, 
the helicopter started flying overhead with loudspeakers, saying that all men over the age of 40 had to come out into the streets and that women had to stay inside their homes. People didn't understand what was happening. Young men in the Poblacion are rounded up, interrogated in stadiums and fields, and hauled off to prison without trial. Hundreds are never seen again. Pinochet's human rights abuses have drawn the normally conservative Catholic Church into the conflict. Though the clergy takes no political position, the church protests against the torture, killings and disappearances, and preaches non-violent methods. If you use violence, then you have to have the force to defend yourself. Whatever you impose through violence, you have to defend through violence. That's why we think that violence is the strength of the weak, because they don't have arguments, they don't have moral authority. So whatever you achieve through violence, you have to defend through violence. Revolutionary leftist groups declare that 1986 will be the decisive year in the struggle to topple the dictatorship. Monthly protests turn violent as the radicals confront police, handing Pinochet the excuse he needs to come down on all opposition. Mainstream factions are harshly criticized for their non-violent methods. In those conditions when you are repressed by violence, of course there are people that think that the only way to face violence is through violence. But that was, in our understanding, absolutely out of any possibility of succeeding. So that was one thing. And the other one was uh, what happened in India, how Gandhi moved and how they fought. Uh, can we achieve this? Uh, can we face these uh, this armed guys in front of us by just walking and facing them pacifically? And uh, that was the idea that at the end was very, very strong in ourselves, in every one of ourselves. In late summer of 1986, the prospect of full-scale civil war becomes real. Chilean intelligence uncovers a cache of arms in the northern desert and traces them to a guerrilla group affiliated with the Chilean Communist Party. Markings show the weapons have come from Cuba. Pinochet says it's proof that his opponents are preparing a revolution. A few weeks later, heavily armed guerrillas attacked General Pinochet's motorcade on a remote mountain road. State news media report that five presidential guards have died, but do not mention Pinochet. Four hours later, the dictator appears on television to describe the attack. He appears unfazed by his narrow escape and returns to the presidential palace with his customary swagger. The episode reinforces his image of invincibility. It really polarized, I think, between, you know, are we gonna go for a really serious ar attempt at armed struggle, uh, the way we've seen in Central America, with a huge toll on human lives and suffering that was part of that, uh, or are we going to try to find some other way, which was very nebulous, and so this search began to find some way that could provide some kind of an exit from this impasse. Pinochet's own constitution calls for a plebiscite in 1988, giving Chileans the right to vote yes or no to another eight years of military government. Isolated and overconfident, Pinochet always assumed he would win. But after five years of organizing, the nonviolent opposition sees an opportunity. For the first time, we knew that if Pinochet was going to remain in power, there's going to be a prophesied, and you have to say yes or no. Therefore, we say, look, if we prepare ourselves, we can defeat Pinochet saying no. And we said, 
How are we going to trust the dictator that has been doing all these things and he will count the votes, that he count the votes as, as the votes are? But we realized that we had no other way and we said, let's move ahead in that direction and let's create all the conditions to avoid any fraud. Thousands of volunteers take to the countryside in a door-to-door -door campaign to convince Chileans that they can vote no without fear of reprisal and that the results will not be rigged. They are greeted with suspicion and skepticism. To create the appearance of a fair vote, Pinochet and the generals write new election laws. Any opposition party that can collect 35,000 signatures will be allowed to have poll watchers, a critical factor to prevent vote fraud, and be given 15 minutes of television time every night for four weeks before the voting. We discovered this, that we can go straight to the street. We defeated the, the legislation of Pinochet and we were able to get the 35,000 signatures all over the country. And I said, look, if you register, I'm going to be on TV. And the day that I'm going to be on TV, I will say to Mr. Pinochet that he has to go. After his party is certified, Lagos gets his chance when he appears on the Chilean equivalent of Meet the Press. He holds up a newspaper clipping in which Pinochet is quoted saying he will not be a candidate in the plebiscite. His daring performance makes Ricardo Lagos a celebrity overnight. And his performance foreshadows the significance of television in the coming No campaign. Pinochet's vulnerability is human rights. The No campaign plans television spots to emphasize torture, death and prison. But U.S. political consultants advise them that dwelling on the fears of the past would be a turn-off. They developed a, a campaign uh, that was future-oriented, um, a campaign that focused uh, on uh, bread-and-butter issues, um, uh, and, um, and it was a campaign that ultimately uh, caught the Pinochet regime and the supporters of the yes vote by complete surprise when it was aired on the first night in that in, in that last 30 days of the campaign. That know what was meaning yes to democracy was meaning yes to more social justice and not no to injustice. And la alegría ya viene, meaning joy is around the corner. It was an invitation to a country that belonged to everyone. The idea that we were going to defeat the dictatorship, not with a gun, but a pencil. That this road was going to be traveled without hate, without rancor, without vengeance. On television, the No campaign is a sensation. Images of a bright future without Pinochet. The TV spots earn credibility with skeptical viewers with compelling references to the suffering inflicted by the dictatorship. People used to rush home to watch those spots. I used to rush home to watch those spots. It was like, you know, 15 minutes where, you know, they use real words to say real things, you know. Torture is torture, and, and it happened here. And after all these years of denial, there it was for the first time on television. Poverty exists. Buenos días, Ana Aníbal. Deme dos marraquetas. Little old ladies don't even have enough money in their purses 
to buy a tea bag for their afternoon tea. Voy a llevar té también. ¿Cómo no? Dos bolsitas. Una no más. No más miseria. Por... As the referendum date approaches, there is no doubt that a majority opposes Pinochet. The question is whether Chileans will overcome their skepticism and fear to vote no. de este minuto para el diario de cooperativa dice que a muy pocas horas de que se inicie el plebiscito en Chile voto no no voto sí Opposition poll watchers now perform a parallel vote count based on sampling techniques. By fax and telephone, the numbers are fed to computers in Santiago. By early evening, they project the no has won decisively. A small independent radio station announces the results. Ensconced in the presidential palace, Pinochet says nothing. Suspicions of electoral fraud grow as hours pass with no announcement of the vote tally. At midnight, Pinochet's Navy, Air Force and police commanders enter the palace. General Fernando Matei, Air Force commander, tells reporters, it appears the no has won. A public statement that warns Pinochet to accept the defeat. Within seconds, his remarks are on the radio. Late into the night, the victory is celebrated, privately and at the NO headquarters. But the streets are empty, under a strict curfew. No one wants to give Pinochet an excuse to send out his troops. the great strength was that it did really come from ordinary, extraordinary people. And they really did put their lives on the line, and they really did come out, and they really were willing to take a stand. I think that we, are, in the world, we really live on power. And what we would like to is to live on authority, personal authority, moral authority. When you act based on power, well, if I have a gun pointed at me, uh, I'm going to say whatever you think and you want. After you take your gun off my head, I'm going to do what I want. How people lived that moment, and they lived it without hatred, convinced that they had been the participants, the actors. Here there was no charismatic leader, no guerrilla, no vanguard that would say, I did this. The sense in Chile that night was that they had done it themselves. How many? Seven million.
Major funding for this series was provided by Susan and Perry Lerner. Additional funding was provided by the Albert Einstein Institution, advancing the study of strategic nonviolent action in conflicts throughout the world. Elizabeth and John H. Van Merkenstein III, Abby and Alan Levy, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations.